Shalom from Jerusalem here at the TBN studio in the city of Jerusalem, the city of God, the city of peace, Yerushalayim. With us today we have Pastor Tom Hess from the House of Prayer in Jerusalem. Pastor, Good to see you, Shmulek. Pastor Tom Hess came from far away. He came just behind us on the Mount of, Mount of Olives. And Pastor Tom Hess is the head of the All Nation House of Prayer, the House of Prayer of Jerusalem for All Nation. He's an author of 30 books or more. Oh, 20, about 20 books. 20 books. And he's also the head of a, the prayer tower, a 24-7 prayer tower that started 30 1987. years. 1987. 1987, soon 30 years. Actually, today, October the 1st. So tonight we begin, our, we have our 28th anniversary today and tomorrow. So that's a great day, special day. What does it mean to pray 24-7? Can you tell us the whole idea behind the prayer towers? Well, it really is a download from heaven because when we read in the book of Revelation, we see that after the ascension of King Yeshua mm -hmm. to heaven, from that time on, they never stopped saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come day and night They've never stopped saying this in heaven. So basically, he, the Lord says that his kingdom should come on earth as it is in heaven. So 24-7 in earth is following the pattern in heaven where the 24 elders are leading worship on their harps 24-7 uh, in heaven. And so the Lord showed us that he wanted to do the same thing in Jerusalem as it is in heaven. And that's why God called me from Washington, D.C. in 1987 to start 24-7 here. And so we, day and night, based on the scripture, also from Isaiah 62, he says, I've posted watchmen on your walls that should take no rest and give God no rest day or night until Jerusalem is established as a praise in the earth. So we've been doing this for 28 years now, and we've seen many breakthroughs as we've been doing this, we actually have 24 harpists that are leading worship here on earth as the, heaven in heaven, like, as the 24 elders are in heaven. And we have people uh, playing harps on all the watches and worshiping and praying for God's breakthrough, for his kingdom to come to Jerusalem, to Israel, to the Isaiah 19 highway, Middle East, and to all the nations of the world. And so it's you mentioned, also, go ahead. You mentioned uh, Isaiah 19. Can you elaborate? Because people don't really, might not really understand you. What do you mean the Isaiah 19? In Isaiah 19, it talks about Egypt, Israel, and Assyria. That these, these regions will worship God together as a blessing in the midst of the earth. And so we see right now, you know, millions of people are becoming Christians in Egypt. God is shaking the whole region of Egypt and the Arab world. And it also says in Isaiah 60, all of Cater's flocks will be joined to Jerusalem and joined to Israel. So we're going to see a massive salvation of Muslims all over the Middle East. It even says in Isaiah 19 that all of Egypt is going to turn to the Lord. Mm -hmm. So this is awesome to imagine that all of Egypt is going to receive uh, Yeshua and become believers. Mm. It says the whole nation will come to the Lord and all of Cater's flux. So not only will we see a great salvation in Israel, it says all of Israel will be saved, but we see also that all of Egypt and all of the sons of Ishmael are going to come into the kingdom of God. And also Assyria, uh, the people in Assyria, which ancient Assyria consists of like uh, Lebanon, uh, Jordan, Syria, Turkey, Iraq. God's going to also pour out His Spirit in an awesome way in this whole region. We're sitting here in the balcony of the TBN studio and you can hear in the background the mosques around us. I don't know if you can get it on the thing and we're talking about the salvation of the Muslim world. What a beautiful, there's no coincidence in that. Exactly. You know, when you think, when you're talking about the prayer tower and praying around the clock, do you believe that the prayer tower should be just in Jerusalem or it can be everywhere in the world or should be everywhere in the world? Well, actually God is restoring the tabernacle of David and that has to do with restoring the church 
In Acts 15, it says that the Gentiles will be grafted in to the tabernacle of David. And we know that's rooted in, uh, in Yeshua, and basically God is restoring David's fallen tent. So it's not only the church being restored, but God is restoring 24-7 all over the earth as it is in heaven. In fact, you could say David's tabernacle was a little tent here in Jerusalem where they worship 24-7. But today, the tent pegs of David's tent reach from Jerusalem to Tahiti, French Polynesia, to Norway, to Cape Town, to Honolulu. Over the whole world, God is restoring uh, not only the church into the tabernacle of David, but he's also restoring 24-7 worship and intercession. There's something like 20,000 houses of prayer all over the world. At least four or five hundred places people are worshiping full-blown 24-7 on earth as it is in heaven. So God is doing it everywhere. It's not a little tent like David had now. It's a worldwide tent. I'm going to ask you a hard question, but a simple question. If I'm watching you now, and Tom, I know you for the last 20 years. I know prayers is a big thing for you. But if I'm watching you and I can say, you know, God knows everything. God knows my problem. God knows my situation. Why should I come and pray? He knows. Why shouldn't he give it? So why do I need to pray? Might be people watching us now that don't know the secret of prayer. Can you give them, open them a window into prayer? Well, actually, I'm just teaching in our Watchman School today. And there's at least 20 aspects of what it means to be a watchman in the Bible. So it's not just one area. But God is calling everyone into intimacy with him, into fellowship with him. And so when we're in the prayer tower, a lot of the time is spent worshiping the Lord. So prayer is not just uh, declaring a list of requests. Exactly. Mm -hmm. In fact, in our prayer tower, we flow in different dynamics. We have worship. We have uh, intercession. We have thanksgiving. We have times of pray, prayer and, worship, and uh, worship. There's so many different facets. Inquiring of the Lord is important. You know, uh, when I first started being an intercessor, I used to think the more hours I prayed, the more spiritual I was. Then I realized the enemy was attacking me. I was so tired. So it's important to inquire of the Lord. David... What do you mean inquire? Can ask I... questions of the Lord. Like David was known for a person who inquired of the Lord. Saul did not. God rejected him because he did not take counsel from the Lord. He did not acquire of the Lord. So we need to ask, we need to ask questions of the Lord so that we know that we're praying not amiss. We're praying the will of God. Because just if we pray, if we're not praying God's will, we're praying in vain. We're wasting our time. So we need to get counsel from the Lord, get the mind of the Lord to know how we should pray. Hmm. We're now in the month of Tishrei, it's the first month of the, of the Jewish calendar. And the, the month starts with Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, the Feast of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and then Sukkot. And you were very much involved in bringing people from all over the world, from all the nation. And Brother Tom organized a prayer conference or convocation. Publication. Publication of Christians from all over the world, from what, 150 nations? Yes. Coming into Jerusalem and spending two weeks in prayer. Can you tell us a bit? Actually, we've been doing this for 20 years, and we had this year close to 2,000 people uh, came for at least 11 days, and most of them for two weeks, and even a few hundred of them for uh, 16 days. Mm -hmm. And it was an awesome time. Actually, the Jewish New Year used to be in the spring of the year. The rabbis moved it to Rosh Hashanah. And, you know, in the upper room, there were for 10 days, they were worshiping and praying in the upper room. And then the day of Pentecost happened. So for the last 20 years, we've been gathering from an average of 150 nations in Jerusalem, meeting as a last day's upper room from Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, until the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. These are the 10 days of all. So the whole world gathering together representatives from most of the nations of the world, praying 24-7 for a last day's 
Pentecost, outpouring of the Holy Spirit on all the nations of the world, and that God will open a fountain over the house of David, the Jewish people, and over all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the Arabs, that they would come into the kingdom of God. So we see this as a last day's upper room where the nations gathered together to worship and to pray for the fullness of the salvation of Israel, of the Arabs, and all the nations of the world. But not only this, there's 18 different tracks that people can jump into. All different kinds of tracks like business track, government track, Joshua generation track, women's track, dance track, many, many different tracks. Also, there's six days of prayer touring. Three days in Jerusalem, we go to the 12 gates of Jerusalem. People worship the gates. Wait, wait, hold on. I thought Jerusalem had seven gates. What are you talking about? Well, <laughs> I know you know the Bible. And in the Bible, it says that Ezekiel... <laughs> yeah, but if you look around 48, us... Okay, so clarify to the people. Ezekiel 48 says when Jesus comes back, when Yeshua comes back, that there will be 12 gates on the city, the of city of Jerusalem. How many people believe he's coming soon? Amen. 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 He's coming very soon. Probably in the decades that we live in, he will come back again. So when he comes back, there'll be 12 gates on Jerusalem. According to Ezekiel uh, 48, verse 30, it says there'll be three gates to the north, three to the south, three to the east, three to the west. And these will be the names of the gates will be the tribes of Israel. But also the 12 apostles, after the Holy Spirit fell and 3,000 were saved Just on the Temple Mount us. behind us. After that happened, the 12 apostles were sent out in 12 directions into the 12 gateways of the nations mm -hmm. to take the gospel to the nations. Even the foundation of the New Jerusalem is the 12 apostles and the 12 tribes. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're bringing the future into the now. We're already praying uh, from the ends of the earth through the gateways back to Jerusalem for the fullness of the apostolic uh, multiplication movement of disciples to happen from the ends of the earth back to Jerusalem like it happened in the first century from Jerusalem out to the ends of the earth. So this is the, our understanding of the, the 12 gates that God is restoring this. Even it says God will bring the lost tribes back to Israel. We don't know how this is going to happen, but we know that God is bringing the Jewish people back Amen. from all the nations of the world. If I'm watching the program and I'm, I'm going to church and you mentioned the Jewish Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, why do I need to mess around with all those Jewish holidays? I'm a Christian, I'm going to Sunday to church. Why do I need to know all these things? Why do you feel that understanding the Jewish holidays is so important to us? First of all, because... The Maybe root... because you've been here too long or, or you really believe that it's important? Actually... When we study the Bible, we see that, uh, as I think it was Augustine said, the Old Testament, the, the New Testament is in the, the old is in the new uh, revealed and the new is in the old concealed. So we're, if we're people of faith, we believe the whole Bible. So God, many Christians are in replacement theology. They think the Old Testament is not important. But our faith does not begin when Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Our faith begins with Abraham. All believers are the children of Abraham by faith. So our roots are in God, in King Melchizedek's covenant with Abraham is the roots of our faith. Some people talk about going back to Jewish roots. Actually, the reality is our Jewish roots are in the king of the Jews. Yeshua HaMashiach, the king of the Jews, that's where our Jewish roots are. And his everlasting covenant is with us. We know that the trunk of our faith is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are the trunk of the olive tree. But the root is King Yeshua and his everlasting covenant with us. And then we see that olive tree proceeds King David and praise God. God is grafting the broken off branches back into the cultivated olive tree and bringing the Gentiles also into this olive tree. So we thank God that we, when we look at all the feasts, we understand they're not just Jewish feasts, they're biblical feasts. So they're for all believers, and very soon Yeshua is coming back. And when he comes back, we go off of a Gentile calendar. We go on to a biblical calendar. And through the thousand-year millennium, which is coming soon, all of us will be observing the biblical feasts in the millennium. Can you elaborate, for example, on Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot a bit? Right. For our viewers who are not so right. familiar. Rosh Hashanah the Jewish New Year. is the Jewish New Year. 
but it's also the Feast of Trumpets. And we know that the great trumpet is going to sound very soon, and the king is going to come back. So this could be a picture of the rapture of the church being caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, is a picture of the, of the salvation of the Jewish people. We know that the high priest went in once a year to stand for the sins of the people, but this look forward to the blood of Yeshua. And I believe that Yom Kippur is a picture of the salvation of Israel. That very soon we're going to see more and more Jews coming into the kingdom of God. God's going to remove the blindness from their eyes. And they're going to say, Baruch Abah B'Shem Adonai, and receive their Messiah. And also the Feast of Tabernacles, it says that the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us. Probably Yeshua was born during the Feast of Tabernacles, but that was only the beginning. It says that, I believe that the, when the King comes back, He very well may come back, coming into, bringing us into the Feast of Tabernacles, when God will tabernacle among men for 1,000 years here in Jerusalem during the millennium. So these feasts, the fall feasts, are the feasts that have not yet been fulfilled. Actually, the spring feasts, Passover and uh, Pentecost, have already been fulfilled, but we're yet to see the fulfillment of the last day feasts, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot. So this year we did something special. For the first time, we not only celebrated Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and up to Sukkot, but we took two days in the desert, down in the, in the, the uh, Judean. Judean hills. And it was awesome. We were celebrating Sukkot like they did when they came out of Egypt. We were in tents, and we were under the sukkahs, not just for a couple hours, we were sleeping under them for two days. And it was an awesome time of worship and prayer. And I, I began to see something that I never saw before. I, I preached many times on, on the Feast of Tabernacles. But I began to see that God is doing something awesome throughout history. First of all, God tabernacled with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. He, he, his presence was with them. He tabernacled among them. But because they fell into sin, he withdrew his presence. Then he tabernacled again with King Melchizedek, tabernacled with Abraham. He broke bread and wine with him, and that's probably when he preached the gospel to him, and he believed the gospel, but he also tabernacled with him in such a way that Abraham, he blessed him, and Abraham raises his hand and makes covenant with him. So he was tabernacling with him. David, when he had the tabernacle of David, he wanted to see God tabernacle among him, so he started worshiping 24-7 hours a day, and they started 24-7, and God tabernacled among him. Praise God. And we see the same thing in the birth of Yeshua. He tabernacled among us in his birth. But praise God. So all of this leads up to the Feast of, of Sukkot. The Feast of Tabernacles is not so much about living under sukkahs and living under booths, but God himself wants to, wants to tabernacle among us, have his presence manifest to us. And so we were celebrating the Feast of, of Sukkot, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles by worshiping the Lord. It's a feast of joy. It's a feast of thanksgiving. And so we were just loving on God and the way God is restoring the tabernacle of David all over the world in 24-7 is really, you know, a picture of what God does during the Feast of Tabernacles when he tabernacles among his people and what he will do when he comes back again. And for a thousand years, he will tabernacle among us uh, during Sukkot and think, throughout the whole year. I think it's beautiful what you said because even the word Sukkah, the tabernacle, is a cover. Amen. Is, is, a tab is something is schach. You know what they put, the, the, le the branches that they put on the top of it is a cover, and that's how God wants to cover and come down on us. I think cover it's us with His presence. With His presence. I think it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. With your permission, I need you to tell us a secret. I know you are planning to write a new book. We won't tell anybody, but tell us what's your next book and a bit about what you're going to write. Well, I just finished a book called Seek First the Kingdom, Thy Kingdom Come. On the kingdom of God, which no, but is... the next one, the yeah. next one is on... Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> the next one is on the king. Yes. And, you know, without the king, you can't have a kingdom. Yes. So what I'm planning to write is a 30-day devotional book on different aspects of the king. Uh, so this will be what the book will be about. 
you know, he's king of the Jews. He's king of all the nations of the world. He's king uh, as the son of God, as the son of God, as the son of man. So I'm developing king all of the different king of righteousness, king of shalom, uh, king of uh, kings, king of the nations. He's the uh, he's the most. It's going to be actually on the most the king being the most influential person. So he's the most influential person for the Jews, for the Gentiles, for you know so in many different world. aspects that we're going to develop in the book. And I'm looking forward to it. Actually, I already have the front cover of the book. You saw the uh, sculpture that Baruch Mayan did of the king uh, framed in a harp. And so this will be the cover of the book. So the, usually the cover is the last thing. In this case, it's the first thing. It's already finished. But I'm looking forward to working on the book, to writing the book. And I know that uh, God will download me. And I think that understanding that y Yeshua is the king is very, very important for the Jewish people. Uh, because sometimes we say he's the Messiah, he's the Savior, and all these are very important. But actually, he, he mentions, he's mentioned as king 50 times, and he's only mentioned as Savior 25 times. And Pilate asked him a question. He said, are you king? And he says, for this purpose, I was born. Mm -hmm. He was born to be king. But he could not be king in Jerusalem until Israel was reborn as a nation. So he had to ascend to heaven. And after Israel was reborn as a nation, then he has a nation to come back to because it says that he is king of Israel and king of the Jews. Mm -hmm. So praise God, very soon he's coming back as yes. the king. And if you're watching us today and Yeshua, Jesus is not the king of your life, you might be going to church. You might call yourself a Christian, but he's not the king of your life. I'm going to ask you, Pastor Tom, to pray for our viewers, for those who are in trouble, those who are struggling with the kinghood of Yeshua. They are still running their own kingdom and not seeking for his kingdom. You know, it says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. His righteousness, not our righteousness. Why don't you pray to, here's your camera, pray for the people. Father, we lift up everyone that's listening to this program today. We thank you, Father, for each person. We thank you that you came to die for our sins, but that you, we were born again, not just into the church, but we were born again, it says, into the kingdom of God. And so, Father, we ask you to take up the throne of our lives. Anyone that's watching that thinks they're a believer, but has not made Jesus king of your life. Today is the day that you can give up your will and say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in my life as it is in heaven. So we lift up everyone that's watching, anyone that needs healing. We thank you, Lord, Amen. that you are their king. You are their healer. Amen. Jehovah Rapha, we believe you to touch them and bring total healing to their lives. I thank you for healing me by a miracle of my arteries being opened up by the King Jesus living in my heart. And I pray, Lord God, that you will, those that have heart disease today, you are the King. The kingdom of God is within them. And we believe you, King Jesus, who lives within them. Remove the plaque from their arteries. Bring total healing to their heart in the name of Jesus. Father, those that have cancer in their body, King Jesus, you're the king and your kingdom is within them. We believe you to eradicate the cancer and remove it from their bodies. In Yeshua, we proclaim that by your stripes, he has been, you have been healed by the stripes of Yeshua. We thank you, Father, for touching people with cancer today, eradicating cancer from their body. We proclaim that they are healed through the stripes of Jesus. We thank you, whatever disease people have, you are the great healer. You are the king. Live within them and you are the great physician and we believe you to heal them Amen. from the inside Amen. out in the name of Yeshua Amen. by your stripes they are healed Amen. and if you're here today and you've never received Amen. Yeshua he shed his blood for your sins he loves you so much that he died for your sins and he wants you to receive 
the king into your heart that your sins can be washed away and that he can be king and Lord of your life. And so right now, say, Lord Jesus, King Jesus, I receive you into my heart. I ask you to forgive me from my sins. I turn away from my sins. I want to be a new creation. I want you to come into my heart. I invite you into my heart and I give you the throne of my life that your kingdom would reign within me, that you would live within me as king and that your kingdom would be manifested within me and through me. God bless you today as you commit yourself to the king the King of the Jews, the King of the nations, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. His kingdom is an unshakable kingdom. Receive the King and his unshakable kingdom and you will be with him as part of his kingdom forever. God bless you from Amen. Jerusalem. Pastor Tom, thank you very, very much. It was a great blessing having you. Joy I'm be sure here. we'll have you again because you have so much to give us. Thank you. Thank you so much. And to our viewer, thank you and shalom from Jerusalem, from the studio of TBN. Shalom.